the one and only Sergeant Major Max Garcia! Up KI. Uh, it's working? You don't need it. I guess I don't need it. Up <laughs> <laughs> KI. Swaget. Uh, Kelly. Kelly up. Sabeko. Danieva. Uh, Thank you all for the warm welcome. You know, as soon as I received the invite to speak here today, I knew for certain that I had to say yes. I knew I had to say yes, and I'll tell you why. Because when I received that beautifully written, well put together invitation from, from Samir and Yogesh and, and Taluja and the, te the entire team that put together this magnificent event with Chris Sean and WSU and Chartered Accountants, when I read to the bottom of that invitation, there was something that really caught my eye that made me want to accept it. And I get asked to speak at a lot of places. When I got to the bottom, I saw a little book that said, this year's theme is around connection, collaboration, and taking action. And it said because of something along the lines of, because of the challenges and changes that our industry has been going through. And I love those words, take action. And I thought, geez, you know what? This world, we, we really are in more uncertain times right now than any other time in history, especially your industry. You know, and if you think about it, it started, I think, probably, probably when I moved here in 2019 with the, with the fires, then the floods, then COVID, then Russia, China, Ukraine, and now interest rate rises. Too many things to list. So when I read that, I knew I had to accept and I'm sure by now, many of you all are wondering what life is going to look like for you in your industry in 2024, 2025. We just heard the brief on artificial intelligence. If you're even going to have a job in five years from now, 10 years from now, who knows? Or the same job. Well, I'm here to tell you all that if you will follow me close over the next 30 minutes, if you will take notes, engage with me, I actually want you to interrupt me and ask questions, unlike... Uh, what you're told previous. If you could stay off of your phones just for the next 30 minutes, I know that's hard. I know, I know. I know your TikTok and your Facebook and your Instagram. It's calling your name. I get it. But if you could stay off of your phones, take notes, and engage with me for the next 30 minutes, it's not going to matter what happens in the world. Because after today's presentation, you will have the wherewithal, the resilience about you to not only survive, but to thrive. Recording in progress. <laughs> I, I love Siri, I tell you that. <laughs> After today's presentation, you will have the resilience and wherewithal about you to not just survive, but to thrive in any environment, in any situation, in any location. In fact, if you all follow me close, take good notes, whatever it is you want to overcome or accomplish, in 2023, 2024, it is yours. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, as previously mentioned, Milanam Max Garcia Head. <laughs> stop, no, please stop, please stop. I am a motivational speaker, former U.S. Marine Sergeant Major, now living here in beautiful Australia, but hey, above all that, I'm yours for the afternoon. I'd like to first acknowledge the original inhabitants of this beautiful land, the Aboriginal people. Sat He May, Vice Chancellor, Deputy Dean, WSU, Lord Mayor Parramatta, Consulate General India, Ka B Samaman Kartahu. Wow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I plan to give this. A Thank you. Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Oh, stop. Stop. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I plan to give this entire presentation utilizing the lecture method without the aid of PowerPoint slide because I'm not as high tech as all you accountants. 
Um, at this time, are there any questions on what will be presented or how it will be presented? Okay, well, if you're going to go easy on me at first, I actually have a question for all of you. Would anyone here care to share why you're in accounting? Why you decided to get in accounting? Why you stayed? Would anyone here like to share that? Because I don't want to shoot. <laughs> Anybody else? We love numbers. We love numbers, yeah. Or you like money, one of the two? <laughs> Look, I, I asked that question like that because I knew I was going to get a lot of blanks. And I knew I was going to get a lot of blanks because if you ask most people why they do what they do, a lot of times they, they really don't know other than to put food on the table for me to buy shoes and purses for my wife is why I do what I do, I guess. But I ask that because your industry, the world is going through a lot of changes, a lot of difficulty, and it's not going to stop. It's going to, it's going to get worse. And how's that for some motivational thinking? But... <laughs> If you have a strong why, your strong why will propel you through anything. Your strong why will carry you through the absolute darkest hours, the most terrible difficulty you can imagine if you have a strong why for doing what you're doing. I believe in this so much that I'm going to share with you why I decided to become a motivational speaker and executive coach. I made the decision to become a speaker and a coach because of one specific time period in my life. And that was the brutally hot summer of Iraq in 2004. Because on September 11th, 2004, my Marines and I came under pretty heavy attack. One of my Marines named Corporal Elliot was hit in the face with a telephone pole mounted uh, IED, a bomb, that I think was meant to hit me because it, it hit it right behind me and it got him. Amazing enough, despite a broken jaw and a bunch of shrapnel in the face, including shrapnel from the backside of his eye, Corporal Elliot managed to live. The next day, on September 12th, we were not as lucky, because we were attacked again. And this time, two of my Marines almost bled to death. One of my Marines lost a foot, and is still without that left foot today. And my platoon commander, who was actually with me when I met my wife here, in Sydney, my platoon commander, Lieutenant Alexander Weatherby, was killed in action despite my countless attempts to resuscitate him. The next day, we went back out on patrol and set up in the defense, and I was on eggshells so much that I told my squad, told my Marines, to get in a 360 circle. A 360 circle, a perfect circle, is a good defensive position because you cover what we call all avenues of approach. And Remember this in your businesses, ladies and gentlemen, that complacency kills. Complacency not only can kill a Marine in combat, but complacency can kill your career, your business, your company that you work for, your dreams, whatever it is, complacency. And I say that because as soon as I put my Marines in the defense in that 360 circle, within minutes, somebody got complacent, wasn't paying attention, and a terrorist managed to drive a car right up in the middle of my circle of Marines. And that car blew up into a million pieces. Boom! It was the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. Shrapnel rained down on top of us with a big puff of smoke. It shook the ground for a second, and it blasted my ears so loud that all I could hear was ringing. In fact, I still hear ringing to this day from time to time because of it. And I wasn't sure what happened. I was a bit disoriented. I actually thought it was a mortar. That's how disoriented I was. And as I, the smoke you know, started clearing, I, we started to move around. I started to look, and I noticed that our corpsman, like a paramedic, had lost his calf, which was kind of an ugly sight. I noticed that a young guy named Lance Corporal Hernandez, I think he was about 19 at the time, had a big, massive blood gash here. And then I realized after looking at him closer, he lost his eye. Some of the Marines were running around frantic. By the way, there's about 100 of us out here in this defensive position. Some of the Marines were running around frantic. Some of the Marines were screaming their heads off. And some of the Marines were dead. And I gotta admit that in that moment, I was scared. I mean, really, really scared. And I became even more scared once 
we started to, to start to take care of everybody, start to take charge. You do this, you do that. And really, honestly, all I wanted to do in that moment was just run and hide. Because that's how you're going to feel from time to time when business gets tough, when your industry gets tough, and more changes that you can barely keep up with. Sometimes you're just going to want to run and hide. But I realized that as a leader out there on the battlefield, I just didn't have that luxury to, to, to call in sick or to run and hide. And I, not only that, I knew that those Marines on my left and right were depending on me to take charge and get those who were still alive through the rest of the day. Remember that when you have stress in your business that your coworkers, your bosses, your companies, your clients that you serve, those you are entrusted to lead, for those of you in leadership positions, they are all depending on you not to freak out. And I say that because I'm telling you, I was scared. I mean, I was so scared, like my heart, I could, my heart was like, I could hear my own heartbeat in my ears and I could feel my own heartbeat in my chest underneath of that, this uh, bulletproof vest, like a flak jacket, if you will. Sweat was pouring down my face and I struggled to see as I adjusted this big, heavy Kevlar helmet that's supposed to protect you. And, and again, I just wanted to run and hide but I knew all these Marines were, de were depending on me. So quickly I started to take charge. You do this, you do that. And then, you know, you take care of him. Don't worry about Corporal Salta. He's already dead. You take care of him instead. And as I started to do that, next thing I know, I start, in the background, I start hearing crack, pop, brown. And I, and I start telling Marines, hey, you get over here. You get up, get up against the hill. You put a machine gun position over there. You do this. And then next thing I know, I feel, and I get yanked to the ground by one of my Marines, Corporal Buckley. And next thing I know, I'm going, pop, 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 pop. I'm seeing movement. I'm returning fire. And then, that, that's when I was, then I was really scared. I mean, really, really scared. By the time, it felt like hours, but by the time the helicopter came to pick up our wounded, we had so many casualties that, that, we couldn't even fit them all in the helicopter. And ugly sights. And finally we get down to the, to the last casualty to load on the helicopter. The last casualty was, was, happened to be my second in charge. His name was Corporal J.G. Melawat. He was an Islander guy from, from Guam. Great guy. And the reason we put him on the helicopter last, remember this for those of you who are in leadership positions, the reason we put Corporal Melowat on the helicopter last is we have a saying in the Marines. Leaders eat last. Leaders receive medical attention last. If there's any kind of gimme, any kind of anything, water, whatever it is, leaders always last. We always first look after those we are entrusted to lead and inspire. And remember that we are there to serve them, not to be served. That's why we put Corporal Melowat on last. Now, Corporal Melowat was very close to me because he was my second in charge. And as I approached him, I could see that he was imprinted deeply in the ground, like, like how you see on cartoons when the, the cartoon gets run over by a ste steamroller or something. And his legs were opposite direction. I could tell both of his legs had been broken from the blast. And he wasn't far from me, he just, well, unfortunately, I, unfortunately for me, I was on the right side of the vehicle, he was on the left side. Anyways, uh, when, we, when I went to pick him up, his, his legs felt like spaghetti, but he sat up. So I thought, oh, okay, he's, he's all right. Um, thank goodness, you know, he's all right. So I put him on the stretcher, and then as I put him on the stretcher, I start hearing, just like you see in the movies, mortars started coming in, and we scrambled like roaches. I, I remember literally diving underneath of a Humvee, um, and, and I had this moment, uh, I started thinking, and I remember having this moment again later on that night as we fought our way out. I started thinking, if I make it out of here alive, I really, really am going to make the most of my life and help as many people as possible to do the same. And fast forward, we finally get to put Corbin Melowat, which by the way, that's kind of how I became a speaker. But I'll tell you a little bit more of that later. So we grab Corbin Melowat's stretcher. I'm on the, I'm on the right I'm on his right leg at the stretcher. We go to pick him up, and now because of the, the mortars and because I'm still here, pop, crack, crack, we're, we're running on, we're running to the helicopter, running, running. And by now, I'm, I'm really 
struggling to keep it all together. I just wanted to scream my head off. But I'm struggling. As a leader, I'll admit I was struggling. But Corporal Melowat, my second in charge, because he knew me so well, he could tell, even though I was doing everything to cover it up. And remember this in your businesses and in your home life. If you overreact, if you freak out, if you lose your cool, then your coworkers are going to lose their cool. Your boss is going to lose their cool. Your clients will lose their cool. Your families are going to freak out. And then nobody's thinking with a clear head, and that is a complete and total recipe for disaster. And Corporal Bellawatt, he looked up at me like this. He looked up at me, just gave me a little smirk of a smile. He was kind of a smart aleck kind of a guy, really. He gave me kind of a smirk of a smile. And when he did that, it instantly caused me to calm down. So keep this in mind. You overreact, you're going to get a reaction from those you work with, live with, all that stuff. And not only that, as we started to get on the helicopter, Corporal Melowat put his hand up to me like this, kind of like you see in the movies, you know? And I reached down, I grabbed his hand, and I go, and it's really noisy, by the way. We're on this, C it's one of those CH-46 helicopters, the kind you see at the dual rotors in the Vietnam movies. You guys know what I'm talking about? And it's really noisy, really dusty, swarm of dust, blood, people, screaming, everything. And I go on the helicopter, and I, and I grab his hand back, and I go, Copa Melowat, it's okay. You're going to be okay. I hear the click, 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 click. You just broke both your legs. I'll see you when we get back home. And as I started to say that, the crew chief of that helicopter started yelling, ye like yelling at me, get off, get off the helicopter, get off, get off. Because what I couldn't, what I, I got in the zone, and then when he started to yell, I could hear pop, crack, bang. And so I quickly uh, set Melowat down, and I ran off the back of the helicopter, and I'm telling you, like, like you see in the movies, as soon as my first foot touched the ground, that thing took off. But that was the last time I ever saw Corporal Melowat, Corporal Soltau, Corporal Puckett, too many Marines to list that I thought were okay that day that ended up not being okay. And fast forward some more from there, 2004, for the rest of 2004 and the rest of 2005, I was a complete mess, suffering from, I'm talking severe PTSD. I'm talking like the kind of PTSD where, where I'd be um, in bed in the middle of the night. Next thing you know, I'd jump up inside of the bed and go, hey, hey, hand me my rifle. And my wife would say, you don't need your rifle. Go back to sleep. She was my girlfriend at the time. She probably should have taken off when she had the chance. <laughs> and uh, other times, for example, she's from here. She's from, from Camden. She came to visit me. This is while we, we, barely after we met. When she came to visit me, I wanted to impress her, so I took her to the Marine Corps birthday ball in Las Vegas. And when we took a plane, when that plane, you know how when a plane touches down, it kind of makes that, that kind of bang kind of sound when it, when it, you know, it's kind of scary when it lands? Well, I was asleep on the plane because I, I wasn't sleeping at night because of my own personal traumas. And when that plane touched down, I sat up straight and yelled, everybody get down! <laughs> and I did that, I know. And, and my wife goes, my girlfriend at the time goes, it's okay, it's okay. And then I realized, I'm okay, but I'm really embarrassed. And, these were, and by the way, I was a small part of the picture. I had you know, um, a platoon of 50 Marines at the time. At age 26 years old, I was. I had a platoon of 50 Marines, and these guys were drinking heavily. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit this, but they were drinking heavily, abusing prescription drugs, getting into violence. Um, Sergeant Buchanan committed suicide. Um, one of my other Marines, Corporal, Corporal Hernandez, the one who had the who lost the eye, I told you about, pulled out a gun and put it to another man's head and pulled the trigger over a little bit of money. This is the kind of things that happen because of PTSD. These are the things that you don't see in the news. And, and so, out of a desperate attempt to to help myself as well as help my Marines, probably more so to help my Marines, I started to read. And this is where my why comes into play. I started to read very quickly books, self-help books, books by authors such as Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, if anybody likes that. Yeah, see if you have nodding. Um, books by Tony Robbins, Marshall Silver, many people which I'll quote here today, 
I fell in love with an amazing book and movie called The Secret. And I actually ended up even writing a book with, with one of the people in it. And believe it or not, all this reading started to pay off. I started to help my Marines and myself, and we started to get better. And somebody recognized it. And the Marines quickly, next thing I know, I went from a platoon of take, being in charge of a platoon of 50 to taking 300 Marines to Afghanistan and eventually be, being the senior enlisted Marine for the largest operational battalion in the Marines worldwide, where I had the honor and privilege to lead uh, as many as 1,500 people at any given time, which is, I know, that's why I have a few gray hairs from there. Thank you, thanks. Um, the, the point of this story is that the tough times you're going through right now, oh, does that mean I'm done? Does that mean I, that means I'm getting kicked off? <laughs> okay, wow, I better really, really speed it up. Um, the, the point of this story is that the, the difficult times you've been going through, the changes that you will go through, that if I hadn't gone through those difficult times, I wouldn't be standing in front of you right now. I'd pro who knows what I'd be doing. Sometimes you got to go through this to get to that. And remember this, there's, through every adversity, through every challenge, through every difficulty, through every failure, there's always a hidden lesson and a hidden blessing in disguise. Okay? A hidden lesson and a hidden blessing in disguise. Uh, to help you remember that, I'm going to say that like as if I were from the South, like as if I were from like Louisiana or Texas or Arkansas or someplace. Remember this, ladies and gentlemen, anytime there's a crisis moment in your life, there's always a hidden lesson and a hidden blessing in disguise. So remember that, okay? Um, how many more minutes now? Okay, just a, a couple things. Because what I really wanted to do is tell you all a couple things I did to get through it, Okay. This is the part where you'll want to take notes. Just go like this when, I'm, when you're like, man, you're, off, you're done. Get off. Okay, tell me that. It's okay. Um, yoga should just give me the elbow. Um, anyways, this is the part I really wanted to tell you all. And this is the part where you want to take notes. This is, the, this is the secret sauce, if you will. If you do what I'm about to tell you to do, whatever it is you want to overcome or accomplish, 2023, 2024, it is yours. We're going to learn this in two steps. I call it the Sergeant Major Garcia two-step. It doesn't involve any dancing, sir, don't worry. He, he was like, oh, man, I'm close to this. He was, he was like, <laughs> step number one, you must write down your ambitions. We've all heard just by writing your goals down, you're so many more times likely to achieve success. We've heard this, but yet we don't do it. We'll write a to-do list for everybody else's needs, our boss's needs, our kids' needs, our our clients' needs, but we don't write a to-do list for the things that are most important to us in this lifetime. Things we want to do for ourselves, for our families, for our friends, um, for our employees that we are trusted to lead. We never write it down, then we wonder why year after year goes by and it never happens. Same thing on New Year's Eve every year, right? People are like, oh, New Year's resolution this year is going to be different. Mom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight. I'm going to join a gym, I'm going to spend more time with the kids, I'm going to take on that dream vacation, invest in that next property, whatever. We say these things on New Year's Eve, but then we don't write them down. And by the time, I don't know, July, August, September rolls around, most people won't even remember what their New Year's resolution was, <laughs> let alone make any actual progress towards accomplishing it. And there's one reason for that, because they didn't write it down. So step one, you must write down your ambitions. Step number two, and by the way, I'm giving you the very, very short version before Yogesh tackles me on the stage up here. Step number two, once you've written down your ambitions, never think or speak of them in any other terms other than with the fullest confidence that you will enjoy success. I say that because I talked to a lot of you all here today, and I talked to you all, a lot of you all at that great event last night at Chartered Accountants. Maddie, thanks for hosting us. And here's what I hear talking to you all, accountants. What are you talking to anybody, really? So, so what's next for you? You know, what's what, what, what's your challenge for next year, for this year? And here's what I hear. What are you, what are you going to do next? Uh, um, oh well, hopefully I'll, I'll get this promotion, or I'm going to try to get this bonus, or if I can get a few more clients, uh, or but I can't seem to do this, or people come to me for coaching and say I can't this, can't that. Remember this, ladies and gentlemen. You'll never accomplish something 
that you promise yourself you can't do. Okay, you program your mind to not be able to do that thing. All right? Um, and then words like if, hope, try, these words all imply doubt. They imply failure. They, it's almost like you're giving yourself permission to fail when you say, oh, I'm going to try to get back in the gym. I'm going to try. It's like not only that, you're putting everyone around you on notice that you're probably not going to do what you say you're going to do, and you're making it okay. Does this make sense? Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. What's your name, man? Kimberly? Please meet Kimberly. Max Garcia. I can tell you, you know what I'm saying, so I'm going to pick on you just a little bit. Imagine, Kimberly, if you were going for a surgery. I'm sure a lot of us here have been, are old enough to have been through some surgeries. I've been through a flood myself. Um, Marines bang me up a little bit. Imagine, though, Kimberly, if you were going in for a surgery and I was the surgeon. Scary thought, right? <laughs> and, I, and I said, Kimberly, I said, uh, my name's Dr. Garcia. I'm going to be performing. That kind of has a nice ringtone to it. <laughs> and I said, Kimberly, I'm going to be performing your surgery today. And I just want to let you know that um, we're going to work on this elbow and I'm going to have to cut you open here. I'm going to cut you open there. I'm going to go in and do this thing I got to do to fix you up. And, and Kimberly, I, I want you to know that your health and safety are of the utmost concern to me. And for that reason, Kimberly, I want you to know that I'm going to try my very best to do a good job on your surgery. And hopefully everything turns out okay. Because Kimberly, if everything turns out okay in your surgery, you should live. Okay? Well, well, if you wouldn't accept that, thank you for that. I see people in the back cracking up. I love you guys back there. Um, well, if you wouldn't accept that kind of talk from your financial planner that we should all have, if you wouldn't accept that kind of talk from, oh, heck, I say from your accountant, right? I know I wouldn't accept that kind of talk from my accountant or from your surgeon. Why would you accept that kind of talk from yourself about the things that are most important to you? Things that you want to really, really do in this lifetime. Things that you want on your gravestone. Why would you say, hopefully, if I'm going to try? Okay? So, to recap, before I get kicked off, oh, and because I know I'll probably aim to the question and answer, I'm, there's probably not much time for it. Uh, if you do have questions, I'll be hanging around today like a bad smell. Um, so if I don't get to your questions up here, please approach me. Uh, or, or if you have somewhere you want me to speak at, you want me to speak to your teams or at your collar ball or whatever it is, uh, I'd love to have a chat with you. So to recap, today we learned the utmost importance of having a strong why for what you do. Because a strong why will keep you going through the darkest hours because you'll be focused on the why for your goals. We also learned how to do the Sergeant Major Garcia two-step. And I did make you dance, some of you, but I knew you were scared there for a minute. Step number one, you must write down your ambitions. Write them down as if they were the most important to-do list of your life. Step number two, once you've written down those ambitions, Never think or speak of them in any other terms other than with the fullest confidence that you will enjoy success. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a true honor and privilege to speak to such a prestigious crowd at such a prestigious school, Christian top rated school on the planet. Thank you all and God bless. Okay, um, our volunteers will come to you with a mic. Maybe we could take only three questions today. Uh, one from me, please. Yes, one from Kishan. He does get a question. <laughs> Max, as I know, you started, you were adopted, yeah? Yes, when you were born, that sort of thing. Went through the ranks, but you had four rules that made you that highly successful, and you call it the Sergeant Major's rule. Would you like to share with, with our members over yes, here? Sir. Yes, thank you, Krishan. Uh, so Krishan's had me speak here at the university several times. And uh, so what he's talking about, so yes, ladies and gentlemen, I am American. However, I was actually born in Mexico. I was adopted by two U.S. Marines as a baby. Uh, I've never actually even met my biological family, uh, except until over Christmas I met my biological mom for the first time. So that, that's another story. Um, but to answer your question, Krishan, uh, Sergeant Major's four rules for success, especially this is the thing I tell the university students, um, and this applies to pretty much any any business. 
Uh, rule number one is I say, recommend you always mind your personal appearance because people judge people within seconds of meeting them. Within seconds, we make, like it or not, we make snap judgments about people. You, you guys have heard that uh, saying, don't judge a book by its cover. We heard that? Did we heard that? Well, that only applies in kindergarten, first grade at best. Okay? So mind your personal appearance. I'm giving you the very short version uh, compared to what he really likes when I talk to the students about this. And uh, rule number two, uh, learn your job as quickly as possible. Now, you all are accountants. I assume that you are good at that. However, uh, the gentleman given the, uh, the brief earlier, the artificial intelligence, outstanding. Staying up to abreast uh, with current changes, things like that, so you don't become irrelevant. Cracking the, uh, you know, if you're a mechanic, I'd say cracking the TM manuals, or for you all, uh, I'm not smart enough to know what your publications are, or whether it's even just watching a YouTube videos or Google searching, staying abreast, especially if you're getting ready to go to another place. Uh, most workers, I think, wait to be taught. Uh, rule number three, always be respectful because you will come in contact with a boss, a coworker, someone who rubs you the wrong way, and there's a right and wrong way to go about it. If you go about it the wrong way and tell them to, to go pound sand, then you can't take that bullet back. It's downrange and it sticks with you. Even when you need them for something later, you need them for a reference or, or something else. So never ever burn a bridge, always be respectful. And rule number four, I really highly emphasized to my young Marines and to the young university students, I say, um, I tell them, mind your conduct on, on and off duty. Because when you're off duty, there are a million and one ways to ruin your life. Everything from alcohol, drugs, um, adultery, you name it, whatever it is. You, I don't need to tell you all that. You're old enough to know. But since Christian answered, those are uh, Garcia's four rules for success. Sergeant Major's four rules for wow. success. Did that answer your question, Christian? Uh, much, much faster. <laughs> much shorter version. Thank you for your question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you, you, you referred to building resilience earlier in your... Um, Can I have a mic, sorry, please? Is, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're right. Sorry. You take this one, you Hi. 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 Sorry. 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 You mentioned earlier about building resilience. I wanted to know from you what was Sergeant Major Max Garcia's two-step process to building resilience. <laughs> Right. That, that's a great question. What's your name? Uh, Unati. Okay, Unati. Uh, to make it to make it really really quick, I'll, t I'll I'll ask this question to everyone. Who here likes to talk to themselves? Good. Those of you who don't have your hands up, I know you talk to yourself. Maddie, just because you put your hand up, I know you talk to yourself. I know you do. Geraldine, I know you talk to yourself over there too. Uh, and we all do. The thing is that most people, and this is what I was saying briefly when I saw y'all not to say can't, hope, things like that. Everyone talks to themselves. But the challenge, and here's what, here's what weakens our resistance. Most people are thinking more, speaking more, about everything that they don't want. And then they wonder why it shows up over and over again. Right? If you think about it, people who complain about being, I don't know, broke all the time tend to stay broke. People who complain about being sick all the time tend to stay sick. If you think about it, we have, uh, anyone here know how many thoughts we think a day? What it's estimated at? 50,000. How did you know that? I read it somewhere. <laughs> Genius. She's calling me. I love it. I take out comments. I'm so good. At, I have a small gift. It is. It's exactly estimated at 50,000. Shakira, thank you. Thank you for your participation. It's estimated that we think 50,000 thoughts a day. Now, do you all think that the 50,000 thoughts a day, well, whatever the number is, can we at least agree that we think a lot of thoughts? Can we agree on that? Yeah. Now, do you think those 50,000 thoughts a day, do you think they affect your, your life, your future, your health, your wealth, your relationships, your careers? Do you think they affect that or they have no effect at all? Yeah. Who says your thoughts affect your life? Put them up, 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 up. Okay, pretty much everybody. Everybody else, um, I don't, probably don't understand me, my accent. Um, <laughs> anyways, yes, of course, your thoughts create your life. They create your future. Remember this, what you think about, you bring about. What you speak about, you bring about. What you focus on, expands. So instead of complaining, instead of can't, this, that, whatever it is, think more, speak more about what you want, and you'll be shocked at how often that shows up. I highly recommend using positive affirmations. You know, things such as, every day and every way, I'm getting healthier and wealthier. Every day and every way, my relationship with my wife 
is getting stronger and stronger, or whatever it is that's important to you. Now, I realize that's a bit awkward to do at work or at home, but I will tell you this, if you're alone, it will massively change your life quick. Okay, I don't have time to go into subconscious mind. It's a subconscious mind programming thing. You just have to trust me a little bit, okay? You, you can trust me back there. Um, I, I, I'm American, you can trust me. <laughs> that, that works here every time. Hey. Um, so, so, and by the way, to, to help with this process, if any of you all stalk me on LinkedIn or Instagram, that's where, I, where I'm, I'm, I'm most active, if you message me there, I'll send you a playlist of positive affirmations on high speed, so all you gotta do is press play, and that's it. So you don't have to go around your house going every day, and every, doing, doing on every day, and every day, I'm getting better, but you don't have to do that. Send me a message, I'll send you something. Does that answer your question? That's just one, one, one aspect. I can tell you many, many more if you um, want to buy me about 10 beers, that's probably how long it'll take. Thanks, right, Sergeant. Yes. Question here. Yeah, I'll get to you, sir. That was an interesting uh, discussion on the events that you had Thank in you. terms of uh, what you faced, but not exciting for most of us who sit in front of a uh, computer. It's not very exciting. But uh, the question is, you said that the past events um, has affected you in terms of not getting out of the fear syndrome. And sometimes it comes up. So now, there are two ways of seeing. One is if you have had a past experience, either you become fearless, or you always are in the fear-mongering uh, state. Now, I'm just trying to relate that to what is happening in the current trends, wherein there's so many changes that are happening, uh, like what we discussed earlier, AI and stuff. Things are constantly changing and dynamic. How does one get out of the fear syndrome of uncertainty that is there on a daily basis? From your, from your experience of uh, your public, uh, uh, as, as a motivational speaker, and from your past experience in your army and uh, the US Marines. Yes, so, so great question. Just to make sure I got the question correct. Basically, you're asking me, how do you overcome the fear, the doubt, uh, all the uncertainty that's happening? Is that, is that your question? Okay, great question. So one, I'll reiterate again, how you talk to yourself. When you see something on the news, don't go around, don't say, oh, GCL, the, the, you, know, you know, when COVID happened, everyone's, oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end. COVID, you know, toilet paper, blah, blah, everyone's going bananas, right? If you, if you act like that, and I know some of you all are probably acting all crazy during COVID, all right? Me, I was like, yeah, whatever. This is like, this is like being on deployment, but I've got my family, I've got food, I've got alcohol, if I want it, whatever, right? I didn't get to worked up. Even though when I see the news, it kind of wants to bait me in. Sometimes the news makes me want to go, geez, you know, is this really like going to be like the end of the world or what's happening? Is life never going to be the same? But then I, what I do to answer your question is for one, I, I catch myself. So anytime you all are having a negative thought, you have a bad thought, um, it could be about your family, it could be about your business, you, you, a worrying thought, catch yourself. When you catch yourself having that bad thought, to stop. And see yourself, really mentally see yourself pushing that thought out of your head and replace it with a good thought. You know, no, my business is going to be not just fine, but my business is going to be great. You say that like that and you think that like that, it's going to instantly cause you to go, oh yeah, you know what, I forgot. We've got some more clients coming next week. Yeah, we're really going to be good. But I guess the point is don't get sucked down the rabbit hole. Catch yourself when you have a negative thought. Replace it with a good thought and with a with a positive affirmation. Does that answer your question, sir? Thanks. Thank you. We'll take one last question. A very short one. Thank you. I really appreciate your opening comment about leadership, and that reminded me of the credo of the Indian Literary Academy, which I think is the best definition of leadership I've ever read or heard anywhere. Uh, leaders eat last is what you know what you said and that's what uh, the IMA, IMA credo also says. Now for most of us in this audience we would not have a life and death scenario the way you know you guys uh, or you know military personnel go through which is you know, very challenging and despite best of the training that all of you get 
uh, unfortunately, you know, a syndrome like uh, PTSD is what many of the elite, the elitist of the elite go through. Now, for majority of the people, you know, uh, setbacks may not be as severe as that, right? And I'm just trying to, you know, take on from where my previous uh, colleague asked the question. So when we, in our own world, you know, we have setbacks in personal relationships, careers, business, right? Often we tend to stay in that whirlwind or in that quicksand for some time or sometimes longer than we envisage, right? Is there a way for, you know, most people who are not highly trained or, or trained to deal with failures, you know, and for different people, the, the definition of failure could be different, right? So for someone, a, a divorce could be a severe failure, for someone, you know, a job loss could be a severe failure or financial ruin. How does, is there a way that a person can come out of it on or his own and more importantly, sustain that through? Because, you know, temporarily, a, a, lot, a lot of times you speak motivation, motivational speakers, etc. 